Welcome to our webinar, Analyzing Your CRISPR Editing Efficiencies Using Flow Cytometry, presented by BioCompare and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. My name is Peter Fung. I'm the managing editor of, of BioCompare, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Now, before we begin, I'd like to inform our viewers that this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and you can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box located on your screen. Also note the resource list containing documents and links pertaining to this webinar. Now allow me to introduce today's presenter. Natasha Rourke is a scientist in the Synthetic Biology Department at Thermo Fisher Scientific. She received her bachelor's degree in science from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and it was in health sciences and molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. Her current work is focused on molecular and cellular biology, high-throughput cloning, genome editing, cell engineering, and cell analysis. Today she'll share some examples of using flow cytometry in genome editing applications and cell engineering workflows. Welcome, Natasha. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for having me. So today I'm going to discuss um, analyzing your CRISPR editing and genome editing efficiencies using flow cytometry and discuss how we incorporate flow cytometry and use it as a tool in our general genome editing workflow. So first, what is genome editing? So genome editing is an approach whereby we insert or modify or replace a DNA base in a genomic DNA sequence. And why do we use genome editing? Well, we'll use genome editing to study a gene function, um, you know, creating a knock-in or knock-out, to um, create a targeted specific gene mutation, perhaps a SNP correction, to target a transgene addition or um, create a heritable modification. We'll also use it to label endogenous genes, um, stably integrate a, uh, an expression cassette into a desired cell line, and then for general tissue and cell engineering purposes to produce novel functions. Uh, this can be used to create very powerful animal disease models, of course, be used for you know, high throughput screening and tissue disease modeling. Uh, of course, also for stem cell engineering and even for applications such as gene therapy and agricultural, agricultural science in which we, um, you know, can create disease-resistant transgenic plants. So a little, um, you know, background on genome editing. So there are traditional method, methods to genome editing that you may be familiar with. A couple of these are, you know, engineered meganucleases or zinc finger nucleases. More recently, we use transcriptional activator-like effector nucleases um, called TAL effectors or the CRISPR-Cas system even more recently, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Um, TAL and zinc finger nucleases are similar. They're proteins with programmable DNA binding domains that can be engineered to bind to a specific DNA sequence. Um, allowing to target a specific um, genomic mutation at a specific genomic locus. Uh, CRISPR-Cas, however, is an RNA-guided DNA endonuclease system that leverages short non-coding RNA to direct the Cas9 endonuclease to the DNA target site. So the CRISPR-Cas9 has truly become, you know, a transformative technology in the genome editing field. And, you know, it's, it's, as you can see by the amount of publications and applications that are now being used with CRISPR-Cas9, it's all over the news. Uh, you know, it's, it's had a huge impact to the entire field. So a little background on CRISPR-Cas9, if you're not familiar. It's a uh, bacterial endonuclease. It's a small RNA, a guide RNA, that's actually a chimera of a target-specific CRISPR RNA, which confers the specificity using standard Watson-Crick base pairing rules, and a tracer RNA, which associates with the Cas9. These together, we collectively um, express in mammalian systems as a chimera that we refer to as a guide RNA, and these can be targeted to a genomic locus to introduce a DNA double-stranded break uh, virtually anywhere that contains a PAM sequence or an NGG sequence. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 has been so readily adopted and um, has been such a transformative technology really because, you know, never before have we had a genome editing tool that's easier to design, um, has, you know, its high efficiency as CRISPR has, 
and it's very easy to implement into any workflow. So it's a little background of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. I already mentioned that CRISPR-Cas9 stands for Cluster Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats. Now, where did this come from? This is a prokaryotic adaptive immune response system that confers resistance to exogenous nucleic acids, um, for example, phage DNA. Um, and it's an RNA-guided DNA endonuclease system. So how it works is following a viral invasion, bacteria will integrate a small piece of foreign DNA into the CRISPR loci in its chromosome. These loci are then transcribed into short CRISPR RNAs that are complementary to the previously encountered foreign DNA. This prepares the bacterium for subsequent viral attack and it forms complexes with these Cas proteins to form effector complexes that guide detection and cleavage of the target DNA. So precision genome editing using engineered nucleases, you know, all follow the same basic principle, um, and that's that these engineered nucleases induce a double-strand break at a specific location in the genome. These double-stranded breaks are then repaired by the endogenous cellular mach machinery. So here we have an example of a you know, double-stranded piece of DNA. We can add our engineered nuclease, be it a zinc finger nuclease, a talon, or a CRISPR-Cas9, and we get a resulting double-stranded break. Now, once this double-stranded break uh, occurs, it can go through two different pathways. We have non-homologous end joining and homologous recombination. Now, these two different pathways, um, you know, act together and, and often conflict with one, each other, with one another. They use different um, enzymes, utilize different proteins for this type of repair. Um, Non-homologous end joining is um, definitely the most prevalent. It occurs at a much higher frequency, and this is a very random process. Um, as the endogenous cellular machinery repairs this double-stranded break, it's messy, and it generally results in very large indels, um, you know, large insertions or deletions of DNA at the target locus. And this is really generally used to create a knockout, to knock out a gene, to knock out a protein of interest. Alternatively, homologous recombination is much more specific. In this case, we actually introduce a donor DNA with our genome editing tool. And this allows us to create perhaps a very precise knockout, uh, perform a gene correction, a SNP for example, a small deletion, insertion, or a knock-in. And we indeed use it for all of these applications. Um, mutating a promoter, um, adding a promoter, adding a gene, or even adding an endogenous tag. So one of the methods that we use uh, to assay our genomic cleavage detection is uh, our GeneArt Genomic Cleavage Detection Kit. So this is a very quick and relatively straightforward and very quantifiable way to assay your genome editing efficiency at a given locus of the actual endogenous DNA. And this is an essential tool for monitoring the efficiency, and it's much quicker and much less expensive than, you know, sequencing, for example. This would be a nice quick check of your actual gene modification. So how this works is we transfect uh, our cells of interest with our genome editing tool desired. Um, this could be the GeneArt CRISPR nucleus factor in this example. Once we transfect these cells um, and allow the tool to work, we then harvest these cells, um, pellet them down, and create a cell lysate. We then design target-specific primers flanking that region of interest that so will amplify that region and that indel containing that, that region of interest containing that modification and, of course, the indel that was created by non-homologous end joining. After PCR amplification, we then denature and re-anneal re this PCR amplicon to form heteroduplexes, which creates mismatches in this DNA, which can then be cleaved by our mismatch detection enzyme and then ran out on a gel. And you can see here from this um, you know, animation, this image, that uh, this is a very quantifi quantifiable and very quick and accurate way to measure genome modification efficiency. Um, it's easy, takes about five hours start to finish, and it's actually quantitative. And we've confirmed this with uh, next-gen sequencing.
So today I'm going to take you through this general cell engineering workflow, um, which we really uh, strive to address from start to finish um, in, in the group of, in, in my department. And that's, you know, the premise of designing, delivering, and detecting. Uh, we start by identifying our target sites, designing and ordering the appropriate tools, uh, delivering these editing tools to our healthy cells with high transfection efficiency, and then detecting, validating, quantifying our genome editing efficiency or even our knockout efficiency um, through various products that we're creating or various internal assays that we use. So I have a few examples here of, you know, a variety of the products that we use in our day-to-day -day workflow and that, that you know, we also offer in our workflow um, as far as options for cell engineering. So beginning with design, we would start with the GeneArt CRISPR search, search and design tool portal um, where we insert our, uh, your query, our genomic DNA of interest find our optimal CRISPRs, which is um, based on our proprietary algorithm using the um, you know, most, most updated um, rules and principles we know about guide RNA design. Once we choose our guide RNAs, we can um, choose delivery depending on our application. We may want a vector, um, in which case we could use the GNR CRISPR nuclease vector. We, could, we may want IBT um, using the GNR Precision Guide RNA Synthesis Kit, or maybe we want stable integration, in which case we'd use um, our in vitro gen lente right CRISPR libraries. Then for delivery, we have a variety of options as well. Uh, we'll use neon transfection, lipid-based methods. Uh, again, lente is a system for delivery. Uh, GeneArt Platinum Cas9 nuclease. Uh, but what I really want to focus on most today is the detection, the confirmation of this genome editing and, you know, different ways that we use photometry and imaging techniques to help us assay and quantify our genome editing and improve our genome editing conditions. So, you know, here I'm going to talk about how we use the Attune NXT flow photometer, how we use our GeneArt genomic cleavage selection kit, we use EVOS imaging system, and, of course, in the end, all of these methods are verified using ion PGM or Sanger sequencing. So first I'm going to talk about our genomic cleavage selection reporter and how we can use that with tal effectors or CRISPR guide RNA. So this is a nice validation tool uh, that we have for genome editing that really has a lot of versatility and um, it's very quite, quite simple to use. So on the left here we have the genomic cleavage selection vector. So this vector consists of a promoter, a V5 tag, and an OSP coding sequence for orange fluorescent protein that's disrupted by the target sequence binding site. So in this sequence in between the OSP it will have either the talon binding sites or the CRISPR guide RNA binding site cloned into the vector. Uh, this vector comes linearized and we just order all the goes with the correct overhangs, clone them in, and now we have a disrupted OSP by our target sequence as well as a T2A self-cleaving peptide with a CD4 coding sequence. Now that we have this vector, we can co-transfect this reporter vector with nucleases, CRISPR or talons, and upon successful cleavage by the reporter nuclease, as well as uh, the endogenous cellular repair mechanisms repairing this double-stranded break, similar, pardon, similarly to how it would do so on the um, endogenous DNA, now we will have uh, OSP positive cells, so fluorescing orange cells, as well as CD4 positive cells um, being expressed on the membrane. Now the nice thing about this system is it's very simple to design and construct, and it's very quick. So within 20 hours of your transfection, you can generally see OFP expression under the fluorescent microscope, and that'll really tell you, you know, three things right away. It'll tell you that your design is correct, that your genome editing tool and your vector are entering the cells and give you some ideas to the efficiency to which it's, which it's entering and cleaving. And 
it will also tell you that you designed these properly, which is which is key. Um, you know, there, there there are sometimes issues with expression of CRISPR. Um, there are promoter constraints. There are a variety of things that can affect the efficiency. So this actually provides a way to assay for our genome editing tool. So you could check several different CRISPRs using this and then just have a very quick and rapid um, method for which to assay the cleavage efficiency of the CRISPRs um, using flow cytometry. So you can see in this panel here, um, this is exactly what we did. We um, are showing three different cell lines here, um, 293FTs, U2OS, and A549 cells as well as three different targets, the ABS1 and HPRT safe harbor loci and the IP3R2 locus. On the top panel, we co-transfected this reporter with a ABS1 guide RNA or HPRT1 guide RNA and also co-transfected with an irrelevant guide RNA to take into account you know, background subtraction or any autofluorescence resulting, and then measured uh, the OFP expression using flow cytometry and got a you know, nice quantifiable result for how well these cleavage tools are working. Uh, on the bottom panel, uh, this, this same experiment is done, but using talents. And you can see that these are slightly lower efficiency, and they also are, while still workhorse cell lines, you know, not quite as um, robust in their OFP expression. And this actually correlates quite nicely with, um, you know, genomic cleavage detection and sequencing methods. Um, of course, this is you know, exogenous DNA, this is exactly what it's called, it's a surrogate reporter, and, you know, you're not going to have uh, considerations such as, you know, the accessibility of the locus, for example, and, you know, it's not going to be able to tell you if you have a bioallelic knockout, but it's a very quick and easy and quantifiable way to look at your genome editing tool in the cell. And it also offers the added benefit of being able to enrich. So oftentimes we're working with very difficult to transfect cell lines, maybe difficult low loci. Uh, you know, CRISPRs are PAM limited. Uh, you are limited by that protospacer motif. And sometimes there are not as many options as you would like, and you may have to to get the mutation, the targeted mutation that you want, go with a CRISPR with slightly less efficiency. And you really want to be able to do everything you can to enrich for these edited cells because one of the biggest bottlenecks in the workflow is taking these clones down, isolating these single clones, and carrying these out, and then you know performing um, sequencing on them, for example. So this provides a method to enrich for these cells. We can either use Dynabeads, CD4-based enrichment, in which we use our CD4-coated Dynabeads and pull these cells out of solution using magnets, or we can use fluorescent cell sorting uh, to sort for OFP-positive cells. And this shows um, that's exactly what we did here. You can see in this uh, gel below, this is uh, the genomic cleavage detection assay of cells pre- and post-enrichment, uh, enrichment with OFP and CD4. So in lane one, you can see that you have, you know, virtually no genomic cleavage as quantifiable by the gel. Um, in lane two, that's a, a flow-through sample from the, the CD4 beads. But then in lanes three and four, you can see now that this efficiency is now 19.3 and 13.9 percent, respectively, which is greater than tenfold enrichment. Now, in this case, you know, 19 and 13 still are relatively low, but this now makes a, you know, nearly impossible experiment as far as the amount of work and um, plates that it would take to carry out this clone into an experiment that's, that's, that's very workable and very doable. So we've also, uh, you know, quantified all of these different methods. So. Here's an example of uh, analyzing genome editing efficiencies um, detected by the Genomic Cleavage Selection Kit, the Genomic Cleavage Detection Kit, and NGS sequencing. So in this workflow, we designed perfect match talons, transfected the cells with a neon transfection system, and then used the Genomic Cleavage Selection Kit, as well as amplified the target loci from the cell lysate. And then we then took these through IMPGM sequencing and the genomic cleavage detection kit. 
Now, in this case, you can see that the genomic cleavage detection and the NGS data really, you know, correlates quite nicely with one another. And the GCS sector is also correct. It is slightly lower. And we do see this in different cell lines. Again, this is a reporter. You know, it's going to be, um, it's going to depend on the cell health, how well the cell expresses OSP, and again, it's, it's not able to detect a biallelic knockout. So, you know, in some cases it will overestimate your genomic cleavage, in other cases it will underestimate. So it's, it's really just meant as a, as a means for assaying this. Another method that we have um, where we use flow cytometry uh, to help our genome editing workflow is with our GeneArc CRISPR nuclease vectors. Um, and we use this for genome editing and transaction efficiency uh, monitoring simultaneously. So we have GeneArc CRISPR nuclease vector kits. Um, it's cloning very similar to the GCS vector that I previously described. But in this case, you're actually going to clone in your guide RNA sequence. Um, there's a U6 promoter. There's also a Cas9. And then you have a choice of either CD4 or OSP being expressed in this vector. So now this provides another opportunity for analysis and enrichment. Um, you can see on the top panel, you can use this and very quickly get an idea of your transfection efficiency at the same time that you are delivering your genome editing tool. And you can analyze that via flow cytometry, use it to optimize conditions. And then similar to the GCS vector, vector you can also sort these cells. Um, so in this example here, I have a pre-sort population of 9.5% of cells were OFP positive. Um, so sorted these on OFP positive cells and ended up with a post-sort OFP positive population of 99%. And saved these samples and ran the genomic cleavage detection kit on these. And you can see that pre and post sort, I got almost 50 fold enrichment from 1.4% to 48.1% cleavage. And this is, again, a very valuable tool, particularly when we're looking at very difficult to transect cells or, um, you know, again, cells that are very limited as far as our options for genome editing tools. And again, this is also available in CD4. This is just an example. The CD4 vector is also quite versatile. We can conjugate this with a um, CD4 uh, conjugated Alex488 antibody, which is what I did here, and you know, analyze this on the EVOS, ran flow cytometry, and then also the genomic cleavage detection kit. This gives us ways, too, for correlating transfection efficiency with cleavage efficiency, evaluating different tools, and you know, assay optimization. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and talk a little less about delivery, but more some of the general tools that we use flow cytometry for in the lab. So, you know, once we get our edited clone, um, we really need to validate it just like any cell line. This is the cell line we're going to use, we're going to keep, we're going to provide to customers, we're going to, you know, do a tremendous amount of downstream activities on these cell lines. And, you know, having high sensitivity and resolution of both fluorescent proteins and dyes is very, very important as far as our options for working with different fluorescent proteins and dyes. So because we're genome editing, we're looking mainly at, you know, cell expression or gene modulation. So we work with fluorescent proteins. Fluorescent proteins can be, you know, a little bit difficult to work with and that, you know, if they have, you know, very, you know, large emission spectrum, they're excited by multiple lasers, there's a lot of bleed through, and they can be a little more difficult to resolve than, you know, dyes. And, you know, furthermore, we want to be able to resolve these with dyes. So here's an example of, you know, some of the fluorescent proteins that we use, um, you know, MKD, TAG, BSP, OSP, Emerald, GSP, and RSP. And we regularly use these in conjunction with, you know, viability dyes and use, this, use these to validate our cell lines that we're making. And it's, you know, really increased our options uh, as far as creating these different cell lines because we have four lasers to work with and 14 possible colors. So you can see in the example above, this is a, um, a cell line I was making. It's a U2OS NF-kappa B GSP fusion protein that's also stably expressing Cas9. 
So in doing this, I wanted to screen several different clones and, you know, pick the best one. And you can see that not only can I, you know, very clearly see the separation between this dimly expressing GSP and the negative sample, but I can also distinguish Cytox positive cells from GSP positive cells. It's really that sensitive. And additionally, in the bottom panel, you can see the same panel um, from left to right. We have the U2O Cas9, U2OS Cas9 cells, the U2S NF kappa B GSP Cas9 cells, and then treated with Cytox Orange. And there's really, you know, no overlap uh, between the two panels, and you can very clearly distinguish Cytox Orange and GFP positive cells, as well as Cytox Green with GFP positive cells. So this really offers us a lot of different options because we make a lot of reporters using a variety of different fluorescent proteins, and, you know, it's really nice not to be limited by our analysis tool for this detection. So as I spoke to before, you know, we use it for clone selection and validation as well. So as we're creating these stable cell lines, often you know, I'm screening you know, dozens upon dozens of clones and wanting to choose the best one. So uh, the high throughput um, capabilities of the Attune and really how, how, how fast and how easy it is to use and how straightforward the workflow, um, it makes a huge difference in our workflow and that I can run a 96-wall plate, screen 96 clones in about 30 minutes and with virtually no sample prep. I just, you know, briefly trypsonize the cells, quench with a fax buffer, and then, you know, put in the auto sampler and 30 minutes later, you know, I, I have my results. And this here is an example of working with the same cell line, um, picking the clone that I wanted for my um, desired mutation. And you can see in green I highlighted, you know, what I found to be the best one, um, H11 on the far right, given that it has, you know, the lowest expression, or sorry, the, the lowest um, Cytox blue um, positive population, as well as the highest uh, GFP positive population, most, most homogeneous cell lines. Another method that I use flow cytometry for and we um, employ in our group on a regular basis is for production of our in vitro gem lunchy array CRISPR library. So currently, um, one of our new product offerings are lunchy array CRISPR libraries and you can see the plate configuration on the right. This consists of four guide RNAs per gene, one gene per well, and 80 genes per plate. And these arrayed libraries are separated by family. For example, we have the kinome, we have um, D protein receptors, we have the phosphatase library, and, and so on and so forth. So we're providing this, you know, not only as, you know, glycerol stock ready for um, DNA preparation, but also as a high titer arrayed virus for screening. And every gene of every library actually goes through an antibiotic uh, selection titer to uh, confirm that it meets our product specifications. Um, this is an extremely time-consuming and laborious process. So we use GFP uh, to optimize this uh, titering process as well as to um, provide some guidance for the customer. These are controls that we also sell that are available for sale to the customer and that we use internally to optimize our transfection condi conditions, our transduction conditions, our antibiotic selection conditions. We can also use as negative or positive controls for gene modification and we use it as a high throughput titer check of our in vitro gen and TRA CRISPR libraries. You can see the vector up here on top. Um, there's a U6 promoter um, driving the guide RNA expression, which is uh, cloned in for each site. And then we also have in this vector, in the control vector, um, GFP and pyromycin. The GFP to aid us in titering, and then the pyromycin for selection. 
And we have two different particles that we provide. One is a positive control. This has uh, expresses the guide RNA targeting the HPRT site. This is a high cleavage, high activity um, safe harbor site that the customer can use as an actual control for genome editing, genome modification. And then we have a negative control particle which expresses a scrambled guide RNA which matches nowhere in the human genome. Now I mentioned we do an antibiotic selection of every wellness library, but again, that's you know very time consuming and very laborious, and we want to have a quick check that we use internally before we go through that entire process of titering every single well. So our general workflow is this: you know we we seed our cells, then we transduce our cells with our new, newly made lentivirus change the media on day three, and then as early as day five, we can perform high throughput GSP titration using the, using the Attune. Again, it takes you know, a half an hour per plate, and that gives us a very quick, very quantifiable titer check before moving you know, 10 days down into the workflow through antibiotic selection. And you can see on the bottom left, this is an example of the plate map um, provided uh, by the Attune. It gives us a very quick picture of our titer throughout the well of our different dilutions, throughout the plate rather. And then on the right, you can see our calculation for the titer of this plate. And we've developed a calculation for the titer, which is the percent of GFP positive cells times the cell number and dilution factor divided by the volume of viral inoculum. Um, again, this is uh, very quick. This is, you know, just taking the cells, trypsinizing them, quenching them, and running. And uh, we have three tunes that we use, and these run on a titering day, you know, all day long. Um, and one, you know, great benefit is, you know, we see very, very little clogging or very few problems with that, even though we're going directly from the plate with very minimal cell preparation. So now I'm going to talk about how we use flow cytometry to actually assay and measure our GFP knockdown efficiency. So we've talked about genome editing and about surrogate reporters and titer checks and transfection optimization, but we also use flow cytometry to actually measure the knockdown, which is really the goal of these libraries that we're creating. So we've designed several different assays that will help us to do that, and here's one. So we have a you know HEC two nine three grit tight GFP stable cell line, which is stably expressing GFP, and then using our design algorithm, designed, um, cloned, and produced lenti CRISPR guide RNA viral particles targeting this um, GFP. We then co-infected these with Cas9 and NF3, followed by antibiotic selection for three, seven, or fourteen days. And then at each time point, analyze the GFP knockdown efficiency, genome modification efficiency um, at each time point. And you can see up here, here's an example of the um, triplicate samples plate map of one of the selection times, um, the fluorescent microscopy knockdown, and an example of the genomic cleavage detection at this point. So, here in the middle, uh, we have the overlay plots of each of these different guides. So start with our, our cytometry data on top. So we have three seven, three, seven, and 14 days moving down. In the left panel, we have targets, target one, target two, target three, and target four. And then on the right panel, we have both the GFP pool and the scramble pool. The GFP pool is a pool of targets one, three, and four um, to simulate the design of our libraries. And the scramble pool is a pool of different scramble, three different scramble guide RNAs that also match nowhere in the genome. And we went ahead and infected these cells and assayed them you know, based on a single guide as well as pool of guides. And you can see via the overlay plots that these, you know, decrease over time, but at very different rates. So on the left, I'm looking at the NOVA percent GFP, and you can, you know, investigate the selection conditions, seeing that, you know, 3, 7, and 14 days, this changes quite a bit for some targets, but less for others um, as far as the, the GFP efficiency. Of course, 
everything increases finally at 14 days, but we want to make things as quick as possible. And, you know, based on the, the data from this experiment, seven days seems just fine to, to get maximal selection. On the right, you can see ANOVA analysis of, of our genomic cleavage efficiency in this experiment. And while the genomic cleavage correlates, it's, it's not the same as looking at the actual knockdown. You know, there's a few mysteries here, you know, wondering why, you know, Target 3, for example, gives, you know, very decent genomic cleavage, but really has much less knockdown than, than the others. And so breaking this up by target and then looking at day of selection at each target, you can see that, you know, target one, the DSP knockdown increases dramatically at seven days post-selection and then modestly to 14. Target three goes through a stepwise <laughs> GFP decrease. And target four really drops at seven and, you know, almost to nothing and, and you know, virtually stays there. Similarly, the pool targets, uh, you know, drops dramatically at seven and stays there. And the other information that can be gleaned from this is that our pool design is, is, is really quite good and that the pooled guide RNA targeting a specific gene should be as good as the greatest genome editing tool in the pool. And that's one of the reasons we'd like to design four per gene. So it really maximizes your efficiency of getting that knockout. Because we're, as we're learning more and more about CRISPR, that these targets actually, these um, the non-homologous and joining that results actually does happen in a pretty predictable matter. We just haven't completely elucidated um, what that is to correctly make that prediction. So this definitely increases our ability to get a gene knockout over time. And looking at the pooled analysis, you can see that the GFP knockdown uh, for each target is quite different, um, but it really varies more by target than it does by day selection. So you can see on the right-hand uh, histogram here that really there's no one pulling all the data together because we really want to use this as an example um, to provide guidance for customers and guidance to ourselves in optimizing these assay conditions that seven days appears, you know, more than sufficient to get the desired gene knockdown. Um, at least with this model. Okay, so in addition to using uh, flow cytometry to verify our knockout efficiency, we can also use um, flow cytometry and, you know, these fluorescent proteins to verify homologous recombination. So in this particular experimental setup, we take advantage of the sequence homology between BSP, blue fluorescent protein, and GSP, green fluorescent protein. And these differ really um, in, in this specific sequence for them in just one nucleotide. So as you can see from the panel on the right um, in, the, in the controls, we have a cell line that, ex that is expressing BSP. And when transfected with <laughs> the IBT guide RNA and the Cas9 mRNA, we see a restoration of this GSP. And now we have an assay that is, you know, quantifiable and uh, verifiable for HR efficiency and have a nice um, reporter assay for this. And the other nice thing is it's stably integrated, so we can now have this stably expressing BSP cell line and use it to optimize, you know, all sorts of assay conditions. You can see from this video down here playing on the right over time that you can, you know, very uh, easily see the GSP and the homologous recombination restoration of this GSP over time. So now, using that assay, we can further investigate homologous recombination. So now we're, here are two of the different assays we've developed for assaying homologous recombination. One is the conversion of BSP to GSP using that one nucleotide difference. Another is creation of a GSP mutant and then restoring that GSP expression with a donor. So you can see the designs up here on the top, the um, six nucleotide change on the left and the one nucleotide change on the right. 
and the fluorescent images when we transect with just the Cas9 um, RNP, that's the Cas9 protein, um, with the Cas9 donor, and then the Cas9 RNP with donor. And you can see that we get very efficient homologous recombination, and we can use flow cytometry to assay this, which we did down below. After we developed this, we then, you know, further investigated this and tried many different conditions to, you know, very quickly and in a high throughput manner analyze and quantify the methods that most effectively um, support homologous recombination. So you can see um, this is all GFP data from flow cytometry. We co-transfected with Sense and Anisense oligos to see which one was more effective. We also tried sequential delivery, meaning starting with the RNP followed by the donor DNA, and then also donor DNA followed by RNP, um, and then did a dose response. Did the similar thing, similar experiment um, on the right. This is the one nucleotide that I previously described, one nu nucleotide change that we use. And in this case, we see the BFP convert to GFP and use this to also optimize sequential delivery and dose response, or, or sorry, um, illegal nucleotide and RNP dosage for um, electroporation. Again, electroporation, that's another thing that, um, that we had to optimize and that, you know, varies greatly and is going to produce very different efficiencies um, based on the different cell line and based on the type of mutation, targeted mutation you're trying to make. So we use all of these as assays to optimize our conditions before moving on to an endogenous gene of interest. So these are some of the flow cytometry applications we use in our genome editing and cell engineering workflow. I talked about how we use fluorescent surrogate reporters of genomic cleavage, um, how we actually use these reporter type systems to deliver and monitor the transfection efficiency of genome editing tools, uh, how we can then use these to enrich for genetically modified cells how we can use this for high throughput viral titering and workflow optimization. I talked a little bit about knockout screens and cell line validations. And really the you know, next thing that we're focusing on is uh, using flow cytometry to perform various phenotypic screens. So, you know, our goal again is, you know, really to create, you know, complete and optimized uh, validation solutions for these genome editing workflows from start to finish, from design to validation, and you know, flow cytometry is, a, you know, an integral part of this entire workflow, um, not only being used for analysis and assay optimization, um, QC checks for our products. But, you know, it's also a means to enrich for our, ourselves and validate our chosen cells via, you know, proliferation assays or, um, you know, live dead cell stains and, and so on and so forth. So I'd um, like to acknowledge my team. This is our, this is our site, um, Thermo Fisher Scientific in Carlsbad. And this um, data was all compiled by the Synthetic Biology R&D team. And thanks so much for listening, and I'll take your questions. Thank you so much, Natasha, for a great presentation. So we'll now begin our question and answer portion of the webinar. So our first question is, does Thermo offer a BFP or mutated GFP cell line? So we do not currently offer these as commercial products uh, at this point, no. Oh, okay. And we have another question here is, why was CD4 and OFP chosen over others? So uh, we actually made during product development a, a variety of different types of reporters with different pro different fluorescent proteins and um, you know different uh, membrane protein uh, expression. We uh, you know chose the OSP and CD4 because they worked quite well, as well as um, you know additional you know internal business uh, reasons for for going with those in particular. 
Uh, OSP was a nice choice because it's very bright and um, it's compatible with uh, with most most detection methods. You can see it easily under an EVOS. You can see it, um, you know, no problem with the uh, 48 lasers. And uh, additionally, CD4, we have such a nice workflow already uh, set up for that with our uh, DynaBeads kit. Great. Okay. Let's see. We have another question here is, have you tested this protocol in stem cells, and how easy is transfecting them with CRISPR? If it's hard, how do we make it easier? Can you elaborate a little? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely can. So um, that was one of our biggest challenges easy on, early on, um, as far as getting high efficiency in stem cells. And, you know, we have now been able to get very high, efficiently, high efficiency in stem cells using both electroporation and standard lipid method. Uh, it is still, you know, quite difficult, and you have that added element after the workflow and that you need to, you know, prove that there's still, still stem cells after the fact. Um, they are more difficult to clonally isolate. That's um, a big impedance to the workflow. And, you know, they're, they're not particularly easy to sort. But uh, we have actually used all of our tools on stem cells. Um, we get very, very good results using our Cas9 protein in stem cells with our IBT guide RNA. Uh, we also have very nice results with uh, Cas9 mRNA um, using both electroporation or lipid-based methods. Okay, great. And we have another question here is, does this method work for detecting CRISPR-mediated mutated transgenic plants instead of plant cells? So I cannot speak specifically to the transgenic uh, plants specifically. So you're referring to, to which method, the genomic cleavage detection kit? Uh, I'm assuming so, yes. They didn't elaborate. Um, yes, yes. I, let me, I believe we do have some plant data. Um, if, if you're interested in knowing more about that, I am, uh, I'm going to say I'm not the plant expert of the group, uh, but I believe we do have some, some plant data and you're, you know, feel free to send me an email and I can see what I can find for you, um, more specifically. But yes, we have worked um, on plants and actually done a lot with talents in plants with some of our collaborators. Great, great information. Okay. Um, another question is, is there a difference between uh, HEFC cells and IPFC cells uh, transfection procedures? Uh, yes, there there are. You know, and it's it's very interesting because you know we see it very greatly from uh, target to target. Um, originally, uh, we actually saw that um, IPSCs were actually quite easier to edit than HESCs. But, you know, as, as we further investigated that and compiled more and more data, you know, we definitely see that it really is target specific. Um, IPSCs, there are a variety of other reasons um, that make them a little more easy to work with than, um, than HESCs, I know. But uh, we do have our resident stem cell expert. Uh, and so if you have any uh, further questions or would like me to elaborate, um, again, feel free to send me an email and, and I can put you in contact and uh, see what data we can share uh, regarding um, HESC versus IPSC genome editing. Okay, great. And we have another question here is, transfected cells are quite a bit heterogeneous. Any effort is put into producing more homogeneous engineered cells? Yes. Well, you mean as far as the, um, the nature of the indel produced? I'm assuming that's what they're asking, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, yes. Yes, we do. I mean, the, the number one thing is, you know, really improving the, the transfection efficiency and getting that as high as possible so we have the best population to work with um, prior to carrying out the clones and doing the, you know, the deep sequencing and analysis. Uh, we are seeing that, uh, you know, you know, again, NHEJ is quite messy, um, but, you know, certain CRISPRs tend to give more characteristic, or certain guide RNAs, I should say, tend to give more characteristic mutations 
So as far as, you know, getting a more homogeneous cell population, one is, you know, optimize the transfection efficiency, get it as high as possible, and then um, often sort. Because um, you'll see subpopulations um, within these, uh, with, within the transfected cells, you know, sort for the most homogeneous population as possible. And then when you get to sequence confirmation, it, it removes a little bit of that noise to make characterization um, and uh, homogeneity a little bit better. Great. And we have another question is, what software is used for your flow analysis? So, um, honestly, we use internal um, and tune software more often than not. Um, of course, sometimes we'll, we'll use Flojo. Um, we, we have Flojo and use that, but really the majority of our analysis, we have everything, you know, set up, all of our protocols saved, and, and we, we actually find really the most efficient, easiest way is to, you know, have our, use the Intune software because it's uh, very quick. Um, all of our plate maps are set up, so we have the data very quickly that we want to present, you know, keep in our notebook, as well as all the statistical data, uh, you know, ready to go and export from there. Okay, great. And we have another question in, so we've got a lot of good questions coming, is how do I target multiple sites within a genome at the same time using the CRISPR system? Oh, so we actually have some really, really nice data for that, and um, I believe it is all, um, it's all shareable um, <laughs> that I can provide based on a paper that, that we published last year from our group. Uh, yes, uh, we see excellent efficiencies um, targeting multiple different areas in the genome by just co-transfecting with multiple guides and Cas9, and then assaying those different load sites. So, and in, you know, one example of the experiments we did, we did uh, four guides, we co-transfected those together, we did a quick um, genomic cleavage detection assay uh, on the single versus combined guides by uh, amplifying each, uh, you know, target lo loci individually. And then we went ahead and looked at the ones that contained all four of those most uh, mutations, and um, we've seen really nice multiplexing results. So. Uh, the short answer is yes, it's very doable. Um, your efficiency, of course, is going to go down just statistically. You know, if you have one giving 70%, maybe all four will be much smaller, maybe, you know, 30 40%, but it can be quite good. Great. And we have another question here is, do you measure other contributing metrics to expression, such as cell health, signaling, or function? Yes, we sure do. And, um, you know, this is, you know, a part of our research that we are really uh, growing in and expanding right now ourselves. Um, of course, as I mentioned, in analyzing these clones, um, we use a lot of, we use a lot of assays. You know, a lot of them are pretty straightforward. We look at the proliferation rates. Um, that's one that I do a lot in validation of these stable cell lines that have been edited. Um, just using our, you know, our CFSC violet. Um, I use a lot of the Cytox live dead stains, as well as some of our indexin and caspase kits. Those are all related to viability. But then we also have, uh, you know, depending on the target that we're knocking out, if we're knocking out a receptor, we do have, you know, then other, you know, specific methods for looking at that. And now that we are making these libraries, we are moving, you know, much more into doing a lot more phenotypic assays and um, hope to provide some nice um, application data for some of the things we're working on there now. Um, those, of course, are a lot more specific because it depends on the specific target and, you know, choosing the correct, you know, antibody to assay that using flow cytometry. We use Western, deep sequencing, really, you know, RT-PCR, a variety of different methods for that. Great. And we have another question here is, are there any design strategies you can use to reduce off-target effects? Yes, absolutely. So um, if you want to look at our, our CRISPR search and design tool, it's, uh, it's very nice. So, so this was created internally based on, you know, all the papers that were available based on what, what we know collectively uh, on off-target uh, analysis and um, different rules for providing the best off-target. 
Uh, there are a lot of different uh, rules that we see and that, you know, we implement and that have been incorporated into this algorithm. So rather than explain and go over, you know, each and every tool, which um, I do have some more information, though, you're, you know, more than welcome to, um, you know, message me if you'd like more detail. But uh, this uh, tool that we've developed actually already has that. So you can input your sequence, and then it gives you a score. And that score is based on the off-target analysis. So, you know, if you want to design four CRISPRs, for example, um, you know, it'll give you a list, and it will rank those different CRISPRs on a percentage that's based on a variety of different parameters. Um, one of the highest, highest is, uh, contributing factors is off-target. We also know some things about what, you know, makes a CRISPR a little more active, and, we, and we've incorporated those as well. But uh, my recommendation would be to, you know, definitely use, you know, our tool or, you know, another tool. There are a variety of tools out there that can help, um, help improve that. Great. And we have another, it's a little more general question here is, uh, this uh, researcher is having some problems to introduce specific point mutations in their cell lines. Is there a method that would have good efficiency that you can recommend or maybe talk about your experiences? Um, so I could talk a little, I could talk a little more in detail about, you know, us trying to introduce these, um, these SNPs. So, so that's one of the things that we use HR for. So, uh, you know, in, in the last slide that I talked about, uh, that was shown on the presentation uh, looking at, you know, the, the GFP to um, BFP conversion or um, the case, uh, you know, restoring the disrupted GFP. So, you know, our recommendation with that is to, is to you know, use homologous recombination rather than uh, relying on non-homologous end joining and co-transfecting with donor DNA that's going to result in that point mutation. Now, you know, homologous recombination, traditionally is, you know, it's more difficult and, you know, you see much lower efficiencies than NHEJ. But um, as you can see, we'll, that's one of the things that we're trying to work on um, as far as, you know, delivering the most optimal conditions and, um, you know, looking at, you know, every single aspect of that workflow to, you know, make it easier and increase the efficiency. And as you can see, we've, we've um, gotten, you know, we've been able to increase it quite a bit. Um, it's always going to be, though, I mean, we're looking at a fluorescent reporter. Of course, you know, the analysis and validation downstream does become more difficult uh, when you're looking at, you know, an endogenous gene because you're going to have to uh, sequence those out at the end. But I always recommend, you know, optimizing with your cell line, um, you know, with your target if possible, optimizing all the conditions before moving to that step of actually, you know, getting your clonal isolates and moving forward. Great. And we have another question here on, could you detect the level of a knockout? For instance, this researcher is working with a polyphenol oxidase transcripts, and they mentioned that they can compare the degree of knockout to determine what's the highest expression. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, so I'm, I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question. Are they talking about verifying the knockout using the expression of the gene using a downstream method? That, that's what I'm assuming as well is, is just sort of monitoring the level of how effective their knockout was. Um, um so any time, okay, so any time you have, uh, you know, a, something like that um, in order to, you know, relatively easily assay the knockdown, I think that's, you know, that's excellent. It's not always that easy. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to get the best knockdown, um, what I would suggest if there are, que if there are questions related to um, pertaining to experimental design would try several different guide RNAs and then perhaps even a pool of guide RNA. And, you know, then downstream, you know, measure the expression or measure the knockdown in several different cases and then find the best guide RNA or the best, you know, pooled condition to maximize that knockdown efficiency. Great. And let's see, we have uh, another question here is, which repair pathway would you recommend to repair CRISPR-mediated double-strand breaks? Well, they both, they, they, you know, they'll, they'll both repair these, um, these, these breaks. Um, Non-homologous end joining is much more efficient. 
So if you're looking for a knockout or a buy a village knockout, then, you know, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, you could use NHEJ if you're, you're more concerned with, you know, knockdown and getting knocked down in, in very, very high efficiency. Um, homologous recombination is generally if you want something a little more specific or if you're trying to, you know, very specifically add or delete a gene or, you know, correct a SNP, for example. Great. And just one more, we have time for one more real quick uh, question here is, I see that you offer a variety of platforms for CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. What is your recommended platform for the highest editing efficiency? Okay, so this definitely does depend on the application, but the short answer is we see the highest efficiencies, lowest toxicities, um, across the board using our CRISPR platinum Cas9 nuclease. That's the RNP uh, platform uh, combined with the in vitro transcribed guide RNA. So that would be recommended for transient transfection or genome editing. Uh, but, you know, we also have Lenti. So our Lenti libraries, which are primarily used for screening, you know, the Lenti stably integrates the guide RNA so, you know, that's going to get, you know, very high efficiency and that you're able to select for the guide RNA containing cells and, you know, select for that knockout over time where the guide RNA is continuously expressing, uh, which was, I think, shown in my, my second to last or third to last slide. So that produces very, very high knockout efficiency as well. If you'd like to use uh, Lenti, that's generally used a little more for screening rather than transfection. Um, there are other considerations where, you know, plasmid and mRNA are, um, you know, also very nice tools, but definitely the highest with the RNP IVT combo. Great. So, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for the presentation. So, any questions we have, particularly, so thank you everyone for sending in your questions. We got a lot of questions about cost and availability of the different products from Thermo. Um, we'll be able to follow up our presenter. We'll follow up with an email response to you directly to answer your questions. So, first of all, we'd like to thank Natasha Rourke for sharing her knowledge with us today and giving a great presentation, and also offer a special thank you to Thermo Fisher Scientific for sponsoring today's event. So, please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to the on-demand version of this webinar, and thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of your day.